Monica, thank you so much for joining me on the Pregnancy, Birth and Recovery podcast. It's great to finally chat. We've gotten over some tech issues and glitches and internet issues. So fingers crossed for this recording, but thank you for joining me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to chat. Amazing. So you have just had your second little gorgeous baby boy, Matteo. Did I? I have. How's it all going? You said it right. Yep. Matteo, little (laughs) Matteo. I did pause and think, oh "Oh my gosh. You know what? It's it's been amazing so far. I mean, no, no, no. Um, Yeah, it's been amazing. He's two months now. And up until now, I've still been saying it doesn't feel like I've got two children because, you know, in the newborn stage, all they do is sleep and you can just pop them aside anywhere and they'll just stay asleep. And only recently has he gotten just so much more awake. And now I feel like, wow, I've got two children. It's still, it's mind blowing for me. Well, quite a lot's happened to you in the last few years, hasn't it? You've been certainly busy. Um Let's start at the start. I'd love today's conversation to be mostly about Matteo because I know that's fresh in your mind and everything like that. But back when you weren't pregnant and you had no children, was there a sudden moment that made you, like what made you, how did you know you were ready to start having children, start down that journey? Well, I know how I it was certain that I wasn't ready. And that was when I was hanging out with girlfriends of mine who we've been friends since primary school. And when I'd hang out with them and their children, because they all had children before us, I'd come home and think, thank goodness I have no children. Like I'm just so happy with being alone without any little ones around. I can just come home and rest. And, you know, even to my husband, I'd say that after we'd come out from a long day and, you know, you're exhausted and you think, how could I do this if I had kids now? Like I have to look after them as well. So God, thank goodness we're not in that stage. And then probably a few months before we started thinking about trying or anything with our first, that feeling had dissipated in a way. And I was kind of like, you know what? Like I can see myself now with little ones and somehow like the, the energy in my mind, like, came up and I thought, yeah, it may be time. So I asked my husband and I said to him, when do you think would be the right time to start trying? And he was like, well, maybe next year would be a great time to have kids. And I said, well, we better start trying now then because sometimes it takes a long time for people to fall pregnant. And he was like, no, no, we'll be fine. And my husband, he's just this really reassuring presence in my life that I ask him for advice and he always gives me the best advice. So I remember hearing that in the car and I thought, Okay, then. And that was the last I sort of even thought about, you know, pregnancy. And I just thought when the, when we do feel like it's the time, then we'll start, you know, when we're ready for kids. And then uh, long story short, I remember we had a quickie one morning and I laughed and I said to him, I could be pregnant, you know, because up until that point, we were very careful. But that day I was like, whatever, go wherever you want to go if you, if you catch my drift. And that was when we felt, we felt pregnant with our first. So we were one of the most extremely lucky. I know that's so rare, but, and actually it was the same for both. We fell pregnant the first time and without even really te- technically saying that we were trying, it just it happened. Uh, were you in shock? Oh, the first, absolutely, actually. So that was a few weeks later. One of my girlfriends texted that morning and said, I dreamt you were pregnant, eight weeks pregnant with a little boy last night. And that was around seven o'clock and I laughed it off and I said, told my husband and we both laughed, went about our days. And I remember being in the shower that morning and a thought came in my mind, take a pregnancy test. Uh, like it's, it was the weirdest thing. I can still get goosebumps thinking about it. And we had chemist warehouse downstairs. So I literally popped in chemist warehouse, bought a cheap, you know, $6 one, peed on the stick and I was pregnant. It was the most like such a shocking, amazing moment. And considering your husband had said, let's just wait till next year, what was he, what was he thinking? Well, I think when this happened, it actually was next year. So Ah. we didn't start trying then, which was the year before, which which I thought maybe we should now, because then by next year, we may have more luck because, you know, you hear that. You hear it takes sometimes years for couples. So I thought, I don't want to risk it and start trying when we're ready because it could take us, you know, a few years down the track to actually fall pregnant. But I did listen to his advice and- I don't know. I think our two boys were just, it was just, we're so blessed, you know, to have that experience. Oh, amazing. What a lovely, lovely journey to pregnancy, I guess, for you. Yeah, yeah. So let's fast forward to your second pregnancy. 
did you have that same sort of urge or that same sudden like same feel let's go for number two I did I always thought to myself like to I would love to be pregnant when my first was two for whatever reason I just always visualized myself at his his birthday party being pregnant and um now let me remember exactly around this so this this was around I think November last year so November 2022 was when I guess I had that discussion with my husband and I said when do you think would be the right time to sort of have another kid and he was like any time from next year again it was that kind of any time so in my mind that was like okay green light you know and so again I, and you know TMI potentially to some of your listeners but I'll tell you this is truly what happened it was one night and I knew I was ovulating just based on my cervical mucus and so in my mind I'm like this could be the go time and literally that night I said to myself after we we, we had sex like I wonder if the baby's coming and then it was very different this time around because in my mind, he didn't really know about it. I, I didn't talk about it to him to say, you know, we're potentially trying again. No, I just sort of left it. But I knew my mind like, wow, this is a time. And two weeks later, it was very different because with my first, I didn't think about it. So I tested probably after my period was already late without realizing. This time I tested like six days before. And I said to myself, okay, Monday, the, I remember the 12th of the 12th, that was the six days before my period. That's when technically I can, I can pee on the stick. So I said to myself that Monday morning when I wake up, I'll go and I'll take the pregnancy test. And something awoke me at 1 a.m. that morning. I had jolted, literally jolted out of bed and I thought, well, I better take it now. Even though they say, you know, wait until the morning where you've had lots of concentrated pee build up, I still just went to the bathroom. And then after I peed, I was like so nervous, like, wow, could this be happening kind of thing? So to take my mind off it, I opened my phone and it was 111, so 111. And I'm quite spiritual. So I thought that's an angel number. Let's Google this. So I'm Googling it while I'm waiting to check if it's positive. And it says 111 stands for new beginnings. So I got these goosebumps all through my body and then I even shine my light, my flash out of my phone because I thought if there is a line, it's going to be really faint. So I took out the flashlight and I looked down and like clear as day, even six days before was the positive pregnancy test. And it was just like, I couldn't sleep for four hours. I didn't wake him up. I waited. I sat down just thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have two kids. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then in the morning he came into the kitchen and there was a nice positive pregnancy stick. I couldn't think of anything exciting to do, but fairyland, you just can't even comprehend that's really happening. And I think that's how it felt for a few months, <laughs> to be honest. Oh, amazing. So you didn't sleep after 1, 11 a.m.? I slept, I think at 4.30 I managed to fall back asleep, but I was like mind racing for a good three yeah. hours. Oh, I can imagine. Amazing. <laughs> So how was your second pregnancy? Were there any bumps along the road in terms of, like I know like for me, my first pregnancy, I was, it was amazing. Second pregnancy, I had the aches and pains, you know, the fatigue because you got your toddler. Like how was it for you? Yeah, my first pregnancy as well, I was really lucky and I had no morning sickness for both actually. So I felt like myself the whole way. I had no food aversions or craving. So I was, I was eating my regular diet. Um, definitely the exhaustion for the first few weeks, like proper tiredness. And then I had, yeah, I felt like an old grandma by the end of it. Definitely. Like just getting out of bed and I didn't have, I had sciatica for my first pregnancy. The sciatica was really bad because I couldn't for for two weeks by the end of it, I couldn't walk without just gripping in, in pain. So I was worried that would happen the second time with my toddler, but thankfully that didn't happen. Um, I think they say that if you have a really easy pregnancy and a really easy birth, you may have a challenging baby. Or if you have a really challenging pregnancy, you'll have an easy birth, an easy baby. And so it's like you can't have it all. And I think for me, I had a relatively easy pregnancy. My baby's amazing. And it was my birth that was like, whoa, that's going to, you know, that's going to be a one, one to remember. Actually, both my births were very eventful. I was going to say, so your first birth was... Uh, I don't know what what word to use. <laughs> I was going to say full on, but that's probably not the right word. Oh How yes, was- no, no. They, they were both extremely like like. I, I love telling this, so entertaining. Both my births were entertaining. So you don't know how my first came into the world? No, I wanted to keep it 
a suspense. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, well, Do so we so so I'll start from the beginning then because even though we're talking about Matteo's birth, which which has just happened two months ago, Luca's birth started. My, I've got to t- I've got to tell you from the beginning. Okay, so basically, <laughs> both my both my babies were home birth pregnancies. So I went down that route. Was extremely excited about it, and I'm one of the few. I guess a few, I don't know how many out there, but I was really excited about birth. I wasn't, I didn't have the fear. I did a lot of, a lot of work before that to sort of get my mind ready. And so for the birth itself, when people will tell me, you're so brave for having a home birth, I would just sort of say, no, no, for me, I feel so excited and comfortable. For me, I feel like you're brave going into the hospital because hospitals really freak me out. So for me, having it at home was like the best, the best idea that I could have. And I, and my midwife was amazing. I felt so secure in her care. So anyway, so 40 weeks plus two days, I had her examine my my belly. He was head down. I had my obstetrician, who was a good friend of mine, examine head down, my acupuncturist head down. So I, I felt comfortable with that. Um, he was full term. And then basically I went into labor in the morning and with, with only my water breaking, no symptoms apart from that. And I had no pain up until that evening at about 6 p.m. And I should say that that was New Year's Eve 2020. So I'm preparing New Year's Eve dessert because we were going to a friend's house and I was on dessert. So I did all that. We got to my friend's house at about 6.30 and that's when labor started for me. I could feel the the cramps, but they were really easy. I could manage them. And I had a three-course dinner, six like six minutes apart. So I had to stop and wait for the contractions. My friends were more uncomfortable than I was because they were like, what is going on? She's here at dinner with us and contracting. But I just, I don't know, like, Birth to me is like a really amazing, like I said, unscary experience. So I, even though it was my first, I just went with it and I wasn't too concerned. And my husband, I think because I was really calm, he was literally drinking. He was having a few, whatever he was drinking. I think we we're drinking. he was drinking soju, like um, a Korean alcoholic drink that's like really delicious. And so he said to me later, I just couldn't comprehend that you were actually in labor. Even though I said to him, listen, babe, don't drink anything else because you need to be like sound of mind to help me out in this. But he just, I think, couldn't comprehend that we we're actually having a baby that night. So fast forward at about 10.30, I said, okay, I think I'm going to go home because I know I'm not going to have the baby here. Like I'm too energized. So we went home and I was laboring on my birth ball. And from our balcony, you can actually see the fireworks from a distance. So I saw I, I was laboring while the New Year's Eve fireworks were going on, which was really special. And the Christmas tree was up. So it was really dark and just those beautiful fairy lights around. Tried to get a bit of sleep but I spoke to my midwife and my doula who both were like you're doing a great job but it's really early days we they heard me contracting and they just said yeah you just try and rest because we're not gonna even come yet because we, we'll be sitting around waiting for you in the back of my mind I was like oh it's my first time like I don't know what to expect I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling but you guys are the professionals they've both been doing it for, for decades kind of thing so I tried to get a bit of rest and I, I couldn't even lay down for more than 10 seconds so I went to the toilet and as I'm sitting on the toilet and doing a pee or finishing my pee, whatever it was, I felt the need to, to push as though the way that I describe it is you've got horrible cramping diarrhea and you just want that to be released from your body. So your whole body just pushes. That's how, that's how I felt, this overwhelming need to push. So I did and I felt something come out. So I yelled to my husband to come because I didn't feel brave enough to check it out. It definitely wasn't a head I didn't know. I don't know what. I thought my vagina was falling out, basically. And he looks and he says, "I see a foot." And I'm like, "What? A foot?" He's like, "It's a foot." So we call my midwife, who immediately says, "Call the ambulance. I'm on my way, but I'm not going to make it in time." She was an hour and a half away. And for me, I prepped so much. I knew exactly what a, a foot means: breach, which means cesarean section, pretty much. So here I am, wanting to have a, a calm home birth needing to go to the, to the hospital in an ambulance. So the ambulance comes, they take me to the hospital. When I get there, they check me and I'm fully dilated. And my, my doula managed to arrive before us. So she basically told them I really wanted a natural birth. So thank goodness the midwife on duty that night, she had delivered babies in third world countries and she said, All right, let's do it then. And within, I think, about 10 minutes, I pushed him out foot and then another foot and then his body and then his leg, his arm, his arm and his head. And it was like the most mind-blowing experience. But 
I think what helped because um, it could be really scary, I'm sure, as you can imagine, going from a calm home birth that you were expecting to this um, emergency. I had my eyes closed from the moment I found out that, you know, his foot had come out. Of course, I panicked for a few seconds, but then I knew from my training, I did hypnobirthing in that pregnancy. And I just knew that when the mum stresses out, then the baby stresses out. Vice versa, if the mum is calm, then bub can stay calm. So I just closed my eyes and try not to think at all, just stay in the moment. And I didn't open them until he was actually born, which was, I think, about 52 minutes later. So our New Year's Day baby came out foot first. And that's, that was the my introduction into birthing. Unbelievable. So you did your first push at home. Did you need to push in the ambulance? I felt the need to. They told me not to, um, but my body did. But sin- as soon as the foot came out, the contractions totally eased. Okay. And I didn't actually have a painful contraction until he was born after that. I think the adrenaline wow. came to play. So, so that's really good context for my second pregnancy because I was going down the same path with my midwife, um, Joe Hunter, who basically we joked about it. We just thought, well, firstly, you know, reach, and secondly, as soon as you feel any kind of tingling, I'm there because it was only an emergency the first time around because we were by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Joe could have helped if she was there. We still would have called the ambulance but she's capable of assisting me if need be in that case. So I knew, okay, I'm I'm a fast birther because I think for that first birth, it was 2.5 hours of active labor. So she just said, this time around, as soon as you feel any kind of twinge of pain, you give me a call. So moving forward though, we knew we'll make sure that he's head down with an ultrasound because I didn't have an ultrasound um, late pregnancy the first time around. So I thought, that's great. Let's do that. And then, yeah, that pregnancy, it went by pretty well. Um, apart from feeling like an old lady in the last few weeks. So I was about 34 weeks or 34 and a half weeks when I went and saw Joe and we did the ultrasound to see if if he was breech. And he was. His head was up, which I suspected because, I don't know, I just had a mother's intuition, I guess. And I just couldn't believe it though because I'm like, it's such a rare thing to have a breech baby and to have two in a row. But she wasn't too concerned and said, let's do some things to try and turn him, like the hypno, uh, no, spinning babies, if you've heard of that. And I did um, acupuncture and chiropractor and um, a meditation, like a hypnosis meditation to turn the baby, like everything I could just to throw, you know, through everything I could at a wall for the for that week. And she said, if it doesn't happen, then next week when I see you, we'll do another ultrasound. If he's still breached, we'll book you in to have an ECV, which is where they turn you externally. So I did all that. And then the following week comes around and I, the day that I was meant to see her, I wake up and just feel very, very, very light cramps. So I, I wasn't alarmed, but I told her about it. And she just said that Braxton Hicks, you know, especially having your second, you know, a lot of women feel it more. So I, th- I thought, okay, because I hadn't felt it with Lucas' first pregnancy. And I was going about my day and I still felt these dull, like I, I'll call them annoying sensations because they didn't hurt, but I, they sort of made me like, oh, it's here is another one kind of thing. And also because I was only 35 and a half weeks, I was like, God forbid this is labor, surely not kind of thing, you know. So I had that in the back of my mind. But I went and saw Joe at 3 o'clock. I was chatting throughout the whole time with her. Neither of us were concerned about these Braxton Hicks. I went home and she had booked me in for the ECV that following Friday. So this was a Wednesday. Went home and, again, they were just annoying, tingling away, Uh, made dinner. My husband came home. We put our toddler to bed. And then we're watching TV and I was just like, I'm going to start timing them because, like, they're really – Like they're not going away. And Braxton Hicks, from all my research, they said that, you know, they come and then they go. I'm just like, why haven't they gone? I spoke to Joe and I was like, Joe, could it be? And she was like, no, darling, just just relax. Like it's fine. Let me know if they get any stronger, which they hadn't, right? So anyway, I just go about watching a TV and I said, you know what? I think we should pack a hospital bag just in case. And he's like, my love, you're not going into labor tonight. Like you're not. You're not having a baby tonight. And I said, I know, but I'm not going to, I'm not, going to be upset about this hospital bag the best case scenario is it's sitting in our you know study for four weeks and I never need to use it worst case scenario I'll have something with me because the first time around I literally had a I was wearing a singlet and a nappy because my waters were breaking the whole day so I went to the hospital with a singlet I had nothing (laughs) so we packed the hospital bag and I said let's try and get some rest we went into bed and basically I couldn't fall asleep I went back on the couch at about 11 And at about 11.15, I was thinking, 
are they, are they getting stronger? Are they? I was like second guessing it now. And I just thought maybe the the smartest thing to do is to go to the hospital. So I woke him up and I told him we need to get someone to come over to look after Luca while we go to the hospital. So we did that. My dad came over and when he came, I felt they were getting stronger. I was like, okay, it's happening. And I went and peed. And just when I, when I looked down, there was bright red blood. And my midwife had told me earlier, if it's bright red blood, something's happening. Like it's, it's go time kind of thing. So we're going to the hospital this time, not in an ambulance, but again, another transfer, which again is so rare. I asked her before that or afterwards, how many transfers do you get? And she was like less than 5%, like next to nothing, you know, and especially twice for the same woman. It was, it was ridiculous. And both breach kits. Like it's just, you can't make this stuff up for a woman that just was really excited about birth, which again is really rare. So anyway, I guess I'm just destined to have breech babies in a hospital. So we basically get there at around midnight and at that stage, I am contracting every out like minute and a half and they're really intense. So from about 11.15 to 12, that's when I felt like I was in super labor. I lay down on the bed when I got there. They examined me and I was, again, fully dilated. But the thing is, he was 35 and a half weeks and the OB that was there with the midwife said, basically, our policy is preterm breach, it's cesarean, which I know. But it's like my mind didn't let my mind didn't let me go there kind of thing. It was impressing a lot on my bladder. So I went to the toilet and as I'm sitting on the toilet, she's yelling out to me from the bed, like, come back, please. I need to keep examining to see where his feet are to know how like severe we need to get you into theater or something like that. I mean, I can't remember exactly, but it was something along those lines. And I'm sitting there and it's kind of like my body was saying, No, 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 you gotta stay here, because that's how the first labor started last time. And basically within 30 seconds something shot out of me again felt like a golf ball this time and then I get up and my husband and midwife looked and it was my water's breaking so because of that I was able to have him naturally even the OB had to step back and just be like okay and the midwives took over and so so this time Matea was bum first and a midwife thank goodness asked me she's like would you like me to film this and I said yes please And so she filmed it and it was two minutes worth of me not even pushing. Now, this is what I have to talk about. I did she births this time around, the she births course. And I can't tell you, I didn't even have time to practice the the breaths because I was so early. It was only 35 and a half. And I said to myself, about 36 weeks, then get really hardcore into the prep. But I had practiced them a few times and that is all I used. And I breathed him out and it was amazing. Like painful, yes, but nothing extreme. And you like you couldn't even hear me. I was in such calm. Would you like? Are you going to say something? Yeah. Can you explain? Like we, I often hear about this. The, you know, the breathing out your baby. Can you explain yes. that a little bit more? Yes. Yes. Definitely. So basically, from the she births, there's four different breaths that they teach you. One that I utilized when I was contracting. It was so helpful just to like ground yourself. So the breathing works, like helps for so many things, grounding yourself during the contraction. So it doesn't overwhelm you, even though it is painful, you're just focusing on the breathing and then breathing out kind of thing that really helped. And then when it comes to the the pushing stage, it's called, they call it a Darth Vader breath, which is basically, it's like a diaphragmatic breath that you breathe. It's like, I'll, I'll demonstrate the sound. So basically you breathe in and you just picture your ribs going really out. So it's like, Could you hear that at all? That breathing out? I've heard the breathing in. I don't know if the listeners okay. can hear the breathing out, but what we saw was it was a longer breathe out than the breathing. Yes, in. a really long breathe out. And unfortunately, you can't hear it. But if you imagine Darth Vader, he's got this like, it sounds like that when you're breathing out. But because I'm breathing through my nose out, you can't, I guess, hear it through the headphones but it's loud enough and it allows you to breathe out so much longer. And then when you're breathing out, you're visualizing pushing everything down without the strain. So like I'm just visualizing my whole body and like my stomach's tensing and just pushing it all down. Yeah. And honestly, like it was mind blowing. I would do it again tomorrow if I could, because it was such a, like, I don't know, like, I don't know even the word to describe it. It was like such an incredible experience. 
And so, like I said, yeah, go. Yeah, no, that does. Now, like the second time you explained it, I totally got it. So it's a extra, like it's a breathing out through the nose so that you can hear, you know, it's audible. It's, you can hear the noise coming out. People, other people might not be able to, but it sounds like that Darth Vader. Yes, um, but it's and, all inside. It's yeah. inside. Your mouth is closed. So it's kind of like you're pushing, that sound is pushing into in your body yeah. as opposed to like and, breathing it out. And that being a pelvic floor physio, we always talk about, you know, opening up the birth canal with that pushing phase and that's how that beautiful diaphragmatic breathing helps with that releasing and relaxing of the pelvic floor muscles and that totally yes. makes sense with that breathing that you're describing. Actually, that's right. They actually say that that's a great breath to do if you're constipated on the toilet. Yeah. So it makes complete sense. It just releases yeah. everything without the straining that yeah. we all tend to do, you know, in those situations. So like I said, I've got this video recording of two minutes worth of me doing that. And then this time his bum came out first and then his legs flopped out, his torso, his one arm after another and his head. And then within 30 odds, maybe even less, maybe like 25 seconds, the placenta came out. Wow. It was just like mind blowing, honestly. And I had no tearing. I had not even a graze. Like it was just such an easy delivery. And I felt so good in my physical body after that. I honestly, I just felt, felt great. And even though it was a hospital birth, the support I had from these midwives was just so beautiful and caring. And I'm just so grateful I got to experience that because it just shows me that, I mean, there are amazing professionals in any, in any, you know, where you, and it's not about birthing. I think for me, wanting to birth at home was about having this continuity of care, this woman that knows you throughout your pregnancy, that really loves you as a person and as a mother and not just like another number that's coming through. So, yeah. but it, I've shown myself that it's about your mental state. And as long as you feel empowered and an advocate for yourself and what you want, you can have that kind of birth wherever you are. Yeah, and whatever type of birth you have too. That's so right. That's lovely. Um, out of interest. So, yeah, so that was my second birth. So, yeah, I've got my two my two breech boys. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And with your first baby, your first breech, did you have any tearing? I know you said for your second you didn't have any tearing. Did you have any for your first baby? I did. I had second degree tearing, but I was doing the complete, um, what do they call it? not guided pushing um like they they told me when to pull kind of thing yeah. so I didn't listen to my body because it was in like a very very different situation you know mm. um so basically they told me when to push and I pushed and like it was kind of like a lot more forceful one of the midwives had to get on my belly to like push him down to sort of trigger a contraction because at that yeah. stage like my contracting had pretty much stopped from the adrenaline whereas this time around even I even remember hearing midwives tell me okay darling now and I just said, not now because my body was like it's not time it was really weird but I, like I said I was really empowered and I completely and I think that really helped the breathing him out but also breathing when I felt like it was time helped so much and it was like the proof was in the pudding no tearing this time amazing to hear that you had such uh, an amazing experience and you were so calm throughout to potentially very stressful situations. Yeah, I know. I don't know. I don't know how I did it, but I just think when, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you've got no choice but to be. It's like it's not going to make better by you panicking. So I just took that you handle things and he was just really calm on the outside and he is always that, that beautiful grounding that I need. So he really helped too. And you mentioned earlier that you're quite a spiritual person. Do you think you're like that's helped along the whole process of like motherhood as well? Definitely. I mean, my background's actually in psychology. So for me, it's like I know how powerful your mind is just from that. And then in the last maybe six or seven years, I've just really delved down this spiritual path and I'm just really interested in all facets of that kind of thing. So it's definitely helped in mothering in a sense of, well, actually, I'm just trying to think definitely with the pregnancy, 100%, just the, to keeping calm and trusting that whatever happens is happening for me, not to me. And I think having faith like that is really important in times of stress and uncertainty. Um, but then with mothering, I am I try and be as gentle of a mother as I possibly can and just a conscious parent. And so I'm constantly educating myself on how to be the best mom I can be for my children and I guess having that sort of spiritual connection, it's like always 
having the faith again that everything is happening how it's supposed to happen and when you know because kids aren't perfect and neither am I as a mum like when you feel yourself getting overworked and everything it's like just having that grace for yourself and knowing that you're just human and like I'm learning I'm learning as I go but definitely having that sort of self-compassion for yourself is really important too Mm. and I know conscious parenting it's becoming a big thing Oh, maybe it's just that I'm becoming more aware of it because I have recently done a few podcast episodes with various experts. Um, yeah, so I am interested in hearing your views on it because just in talking to you, I feel calm and you, you've just got that lovely persona oh. where I think you probably naturally consciously parent um, anyway. Oh, thank you. That's so. That's such a nice compliment. <laughs> I mean, like for me, I, I'm a bit of a nerd, right? So all the way from school onwards, if I'm delving into something, I need to know everything about it. So with psychology, I just, I had to get my honours. Like that was for me really important. So I was like just head down in the books. And then when I fell pregnant, it was like head down in the books for pregnancy. And now, and as I was becoming a parent, it was head down in the parenting books and just wanting to be the best version of myself. And now when you have children, it's like, oh my God, the the game is like elevated so much because you're you're the number one influence on human beings, other human beings and how they're going to function as adults. And I think the, the whole conscious parenting and aware parenting movement, it's happening now because finally we're sort of giving children more of a voice. And before it was like kids don't remember from the ages of birth till three or four. So whatever you do to them, it's not going to affect them in the future. And now, thank God, science is, you know, catching up and we're, we're seeing that that's so not the case that absolutely what we do from from pregnancy onwards can completely change the course of our children's lives and their mental states and their physical health and everything right so of course I think conscious parenting is so important I mean look that's just like a a term right but it's more so for me respectful parenting so respecting your your infant your child as another human being not as an extension of yourself that you know I'm the mum I'm the boss that's why I like you know, and so that's been huge to me. And I think just seeing like how a lot of, not a lot, but a lot, there are many adults that really don't have that emotional intelligence, that don't know how to regulate their emotions, that I can just fly off the wall in a second, that aggression, that anger, that everything's built up. And that's not their, well, it is their fault in a sense, but it's because of their upbringing. You know, they were never taught how to regulate their emotions because they were told to shut up or, you know, don't cry, don't, you're a big, boy you're a big girl be strong like all this kind of stuff when actually we need to be so nurturing I feel in the first few years for them to build up that confidence and and things like that I mean look I'm definitely not an expert but I could go on about this all day because it's Mm. I think it's really really important and it's so interesting because parenting is something where it's evolved so much in a relatively short period of time imagine 200 years ago we were sending you know 10 year olds out to work and earn money (laughs) So, and then it's taken a, you know, it was only 50 years ago, like kids were to be seen but not heard. So yes. it, um, and with parenting, traditionally, you've only had one pe- person or two people to learn from, and that's your own parents. So it's really only in this last decade of probably internet and, you know, the ease of education and the ease of information that we have now in this day and age that it's becoming it's becoming a thing. I agree. It's definitely, I feel like social media, the internet, just the, how fast we can spread information around and, you know, where, where you can get information from, like just opening up your Instagram, you could actually be shown something that mm. is really beneficial. And for me, that's how I found lots of different books and things like that, that um, yeah. I've delved down. And yeah. I also think As parents, and I know this is totally a different tangent that we're taking, Monica, but as parents, we, this is sort of the first generation that's coming across issues that no other parents have had before, like with social media and our children having devices. And I know you've got younger children, but like my oldest is getting, you know, close to high school. And, you know, it's just a whole new world of how to parent Um whilst these relatively young children have access to information that we never had access to at such a young age. 
Absolutely. It's it's a whole another ball game. And I, I can't think about it too much because it's extremely overwhelming when you do think about it. It's like we just got to take it day by day mm. and just roll with it as, as best as we can. Because like you said, it's a new frontier. None of us know what to do because we nobody before us has had mm. to do this. And it just evolves, doesn't it, too? Yes. So going back to um, you've now got the two children in the mix. How have you helped? It's Luca, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. How have you helped Luca? Well, how has he adjusted to having a little baby brother? Well, I did research about this while I was pregnant with Matteo um, about how to handle siblings or how to sort of introduce the baby to the older sibling to sort of try and alleviate as much of the jealousy and the insecurity as possible. And so some advice I got that I thought was really helpful and I've done myself is basically when you're with the baby and obviously newborns need a lot of our attention, a lot of time, never blame the baby for something that you can't do with your child, your older child. So for example, if I'm breastfeeding Mateo and Luca wants to play with me, I don't say, wait a second, love, my love, I've just got to finish breastfeeding Mateo or Mateo's hungry or something. I never put Mateo's name into it. I just say, give me one second, mommy's coming kind of thing. So it's never like, oh, because of him, I can't have time with mum. Like he's never, he never sort of hopefully associates that. And um, I found like with Luca, he's a really gentle, calm soul anyway. Like he, I have had amazing experience with him being my first, right? He's amazing. And so he, the worst of his jealousy thus far has been like, mom, put Matteo to bed. That's what he says to me. And then I know that's okay. He's reached his threshold. And then I do. And I think, I don't know if Matteo, him being a second child, he's a lot more patient. Like, so I, I take him off the boob mid feed, pop him down. And I go and play with Luca for five minutes because I want him to feel like he still has me. And Matteo just happily sits there and chills out until I'm ready to pick him back up again. So it's like, for me, putting Luca first still, while Matteo is still so little and doesn't understand yet, putting him first so he knows he's still my number one, that this new baby hasn't come and threatened our relationship. And then slowly as they grow, and I'm hoping that, you know, when he gets bigger and can play with him, which he already has, like he makes sounds and he's like, oh, Matteo is talking kind of thing. But it's like slow and steady. And you can't expect too much, I don't think, from your toddler if it's your second, your firstborn is a toddler or, you know, the eldest it's still, they're still so little, they don't understand and we have to sort of give them grace as well. And I do have to say that I remember this, like, because normally I can I can be calm, right, but I'm not perfect at all. And I remember this because Luca, like I said, is really chill and relaxed and easy. And a few weeks ago, or maybe maybe when Matteo was two weeks or something, we had a great day and Matteo, I mean, Luca was really happy all day so I wasn't expecting this to come out. And I had given him a bowl or something to eat and for whatever reason, he just decided to throw it on the ground. And I was like, look, uh, what's happened kind of thing. Don't do that, my love. And he picks it up and on purpose throws it on the ground and it like, shatters. It was like porcelain because he's so good at, he d- doesn't do anything. Like he's very good at what, you know, looking after his, his things. And I've never had to give him like plastic because he's easy to look after. But anyway, he smashed it. And I just was like, oh my God, I started crying. Like what's happened to my good boy? And what have I done wrong? Kind of thing. I felt so bad in the moment. And I screamed at him in the moment as well. I was like, you can't do that. Like I really lost my cool. And it's just not how I like to parent at all. But then I, after, after I cooled down, I gave myself grace. I apologized to him and I explained to him it wasn't about him. It was about, you know, my emotions and because I think that's really important to apologize to your children. And then I did my research to see how to handle it best later. And it's just basically what I've learned about children and their actions. It's not the behavior. It's why the behavior is happening kind of thing. And it's don't blame your children and don't look at your child as being a bad kid. It's just a good kid having a hard time and try and understand where that's coming from. And of course, for me, I knew it was, you know, him dealing with this huge life change, but it's like, yeah, you, you've got to give yourself and your children the grace and we're all going to stuff up. We're all going to mess up. It's important to apologize to them. And then to also just, like I said, give yourself the grace and just know that you're, you're trying your best and that's all we can do. Love that. You're absolutely right. Um, do you have one more tip for parents who perhaps have a newborn on the way and they've already got a toddler? Like another quick tip because that what you said before <laughs> was amazing in terms of just the way you approach how you talk to Luca in terms of instead of saying, I'm just breastfeeding Mateo, give me five minutes, you, you, you reframe it in a different way. Do you have any other tips like that? Mm. Putting you on the spot here. One tip is kind of like 
try and include them doing. So can you grab, can you put Mateo's nappy in the bin? Oh my gosh, thank you so much. You're such a big help. And like not to do with the baby, but making sure that you're still doing things with the toddler. So, cause it can be really easy to be like putting on the TV for them, which I definitely do because it's, we need a break sometimes as well, right? Especially having a baby, like they need your attention. You don't want your toddler to be crying for you the whole time. So you give them a bit of TV time. But when you can avoid that is like try and help them cook with you, which it's like not a help at all. It's a complete hindrance for us, but he gets in so involved. So I've been doing that or like helping me wash the dishes. When I say help, I mean, you know, in inverted commas, like yeah. making them feel like they're a part of the, the household. That's been really helpful and they really engage in what they're doing. And then another tip that's like not so deep, but a baby carrier is like my saving grace. Oh my gosh. Because for me, I just, I really think that when you've got two, the baby is the easiest one for sure. You know, you strap them on and they're so happy to be on you. And then you can still be the mum to the, to the child that still needs you. Cause we forget about them. And we, for me, when I got home from the hospital, seeing Luca for the first time, I was like, when did your hands get so big? Like, he became this big boy and it's like makes me so emotional because when I left, he was truly my little baby. He looks like a different kid to me. So we forget that there's still that little baby that we left behind, you know, when we went to birth our new baby. So like remind yourself that when they do get, when they throw their tantrums, which they're going to do, it's because they're still so little and their whole world has been turned upside down. Yeah, love that. And it's once you have a new baby, you feel your toddler look so big, don't you? Mm-hmm. Like they just they look so big. But then, like for me, when I look back on photos of my second and third newborns, I was like, oh my gosh, my other kids, you know, whether or not it was a one or two, they were yeah. so small, and I was probably putting too much not responsibility, but you know what I mean. Like you, you don't, exactly, yeah. You forget how small they are when you're in the moment, and you've got a little baby. Yeah, love that. Well, thank you so much, Monica. I'm aware of your time and I appreciate it's, it's, you. It's hot. It's very easy to forget everything in the moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Monica, thank you so much for joining me today. I am aware of your time and I appreciate you taking the time out to share your journey. I know so many mums will really like I think you've got offer so much um, in your story and your words of wisdom, like you, you're quite an inspirational person. So thank you so much for sharing your story today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. For those that would like to come and connect with you, what's the best place for them to reach you? Um, on social media, I'm on Instagram. So at Monica with a K underscore rad, R-A-D. Perfect. And I'll put all those links in the show notes. Thanks so much, Monica. Thank you, hon. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Mama podcast brought to you by the Fitness Mama freebies found at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash free. So please take a few seconds to leave a review, subscribe so you don't miss an episode and be sure to take a screenshot of this podcast, upload it to your social media and tag me at Fitness Mama so I can give you a shout out too. Until next time, remember an active pregnancy, confident childbirth and strong postnatal recovery is something that you deserve. Remember our disclaimer, materials and contents in this podcast are intended as general information only and shouldn't substitute any medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. I'll see you soon.